This class is in memory of Jared Ochen, and we are going to learn Parshas Bolok, page 297. We will get into the story, and then we'll get to what we are really looking for. Page 297, the story is about Bolok and, and Bilam, the famous gentle prophet that was as great, as the Talmud says, as great as Moses. That's how great Bilam was. But even when God gives you powers of a prophet, you still have free choice what to do with it. To use it in a good way or to use it in a bad way. And that's an amazing thing to learn. How, how does Bilam uh, rank because the very last verse of the Torah in Deuteronomy says there was no prophet greater than Moses? And then the Talmud says uh -huh. no, no prophet greater than Moses among Jews. Uh -huh. But among non-Jews there was. And who it is? Bilam. On this line, the Talmud says the statement. Uh -huh. Just on this line. So does it mean that his prophecy was greater only in certain respects than Moses's? Uh, no, no, as, as great as mm -hmm. Moses, not okay. greater than Moses. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, but is he God, the point that? is, it's based on the idea mm -hmm. that Barrels. everything for yeah that it must be true free choice. If it's in the Jewish side, it has to be in the. If it's in the good side, it has to be in the bad side. If it's in the if it's in the holy side, there is such prophecy. It must be in the non-holy side, also such power of prophecy. And then a person can make a free choice. If not, that's no free choice. If only the good people have prophecy, and only the good people win the lotteries, and only the good people do this, then there is no free choice. For sure, I want to choose to choose the good people. But if but if it's it's two side, therefore, whenever there is greatness on the Jewish side, there is greatness on the non-Jewish side. More correct, it's not about Jews or not Jews. Whenever there is greatness on the good side, there is greatness on the non-good side. Whenever there is no greatness on the good side, there is, no, there is no greatness around. When you see today, we don't have great leaders from any way, any kind. Because there is no greatness. Then, and that's, that's always like this. For example, when the war, in the time of the Talmud, when there is great Talmudic scholars, the rest of the people were very ignorant. Now we don't have greatness, but we don't, we don't have ignorance. This kind of ignorance. It always goes together. And that's what when you had Moses, you have a Bila. It must be like this. That's what I mean. Because if not, there is no free choice. Page 297, in chapter 22, number 2. Go ahead. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw that all that Israel had done to the Amorite. And Moab became terrified of the people of Israel because of their great numbers. And so Moab detested B'nai Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this assembly will lick up everything around us, just like the ox laps up the herbs of the field. Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. Basically, the king of Moab was afraid. Balak was afraid of the Jewish people. They're getting closer to Israel. They're coming. And they know that the Jewish people can have miracles. God is on their side. They will wipe us out. I heard what happened to the Egyptians. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't forget. Even it was four years before, he didn't forget what happened to the Egyptians. And he was afraid of them. Exactly. Then what was he doing? Number five. He sent emissaries to uh, Bilam, the son of uh, Be uh, Beor. Emissaries. Emissaries. I said, I thought he said. Oh, he sent emissaries to Bilam, the son of Beor to uh, Pesor, which is the river, which is by the river, the land of his people, to call him, saying, "Behold, a nation came out of Egypt. Behold, they have covered the face of the earth and is located across from me. And now, please come and curse this nation for me, for it is too mighty for me. Perhaps it'll be, it, perhaps it will enable us to strike at him and banish them from the land. For I know that whomever you bless is blessed, and whomever you curse is cursed." Okay. He decided to start a new to try a new approach. Wars doesn't work with them. They said, "Let's figure out what's their power." We don't know the power. The power is Moses. Moses is a prophet. The power is God. He's a spiritual power. He says we'll also we'll hire, our, we'll hire our own prophet. We will curse them, and that's how we get rid of them. He tried the Jewish technique. That's what he tried. Okay. Quick question on the pronunciation. Uh, some pronounce it Balaam and some pronounce it Bilam. Do you know why there's a difference? Bilam. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if anybody was pronounce it Balaam. Yes. In some of the non-Orthodox books, it's spelled B-A-A-L-A-M. 
and I've heard it pronounced Balam, and I've heard it pronounced Bilam. I, I mean, I know, I, know I speak, <laughs> I, I read Ibo, I don't read good English. <laughs> I can tell you that in Ibo it's Bilam, <laughs> and could be it comes from the concept of Balam, from the word Balam means to swallow. But the way we read it is Bilam. But uh, I don't know why they spell it differently, Balam. Is Bilam has a meaning? Bilam, no, it's a name. But it comes from the same, as I said, comes from the word to, to swallow, to swallow up. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that he says, I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse Obviously, is he had a reputation. He, had a, mm-hmm. he, was a, he, he proved himself to know that he can curse, whoever he curses, he's been cursed. That's, what they, that's, that's why he, he, he wanted to hire him. But it's also interesting because I don't think Moshe was known for that. I don't think it's Moshe... Abraham. <coughs> it yeah, it's written about Abraham. Um, um, no, I wait when it's even something else. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Here he says that who you will bless will be blessed. Uh, okay, but it's still, it's, it's quite similar. It's very similar, yes. But it's different. And there has to be a pair, I mean, there's a parallel. Sure. With the earlier. Um, my mm-hmm. Ben, uh, in the in Perkei Avot, he says, what are the difference between the disciples of Abraham and no. the disciples of Bilam? That's how you teach They them. compare Abraham to Bilam. Otherwise, you couldn't see the difference. In this because because in the, in the, Medrash, the, <coughs> town, the the explanation is why we don't say what's the difference between Abraham and Bilam. Why we say what's the difference between <coughs> Abraham's disciples and Bilam's disciples. Because Abraham and Bilam might look very similar. It would be very hard to learn the difference. Both of them will have long white beard, and both of them will look like good people. But you look at the disciples. It means to say, if you want to test a philosophy, a great leader, a rabbi, what he says, everybody might say almost the same. You look at the disciples, what came out from his philosophy, and then you can really test it. You look here, and you look there, and you see the difference. Can you really test that with Akiva, though? Because he had 20,000 students depending upon which version you accept. Uh, Even the 24,000 students, they were yeah. good people. The only problem that they had, that they were not nice to each other so much. Yeah. Therefore, and they and end up to have other students. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you we, got a new Krabba student, five yes, students. Yeah. five, and I mean, basically, all of us are the disciples of Rabbi Akiva, you know what I mean? We all learn the... But ultimately, yeah, what, what, the, the, what the, the, the disciples reflect on the teacher. You cannot, you cannot take it away, yes. One way or another, it's reflecting on the teacher, yes. Okay, we are in number seven. And the elders of Moab in Midian went with magic charms in their hands. They came to Bilam and conveyed Balak's message to him. He replied to them, Spend this night here, and then I will give you an answer according to what other night tells me. And the dignitaries of Moab remained with Bilam. Okay, they came to him. He sent a delegation to the prophet and told them, he invited them to come and curse the Jewish people. And they, he said, stay with me the night, and I will tell you in the morning. Why stay with me the night? Because he needs to have a conversation with God to see if God allows them to do it. Bilam thought he will be able to convince God to allow him to curse the Jewish people. Even Bilam knew very well that God doesn't want it. How do we understand Bilaam's prophetic aspect versus his sorcerer aspect? I mean, you have about split Jewish views on which he is at which time. What do you mean sorcery aspects? Well, a, some answer. Some midrashim basically say that he has, you know, his own independent, you know, dark side powers that independent from being a prophet. He's a sorcerer. He's a magician. He's a this. He's a that. It's all uh-huh. powers that God gave him. And then ultimately, you see, he didn't do anything that God didn't allow him. <coughs> the real power that he has was as a prophet. He was also, I also saw so all of this, but therefore he wanted to curse them with his mouth, with his power of, of prophecy. And eventually Hashem didn't let him. How does he get to be both, though? Both a prophet and a sorcerer kind of at the same time. I don't think it's so much different. I mean, in, in the bad side, it could... You develop it as a part of the job. As a well, part now, well, now the necromancers for in Pharaoh's court could tap into some kind of powers. You're right. Is that, but that, is that what you're referring to? Well, in that, part, that um, some, of, some people trace you know, uh, Bilaam back, they to, they back they to Pharaoh's they time and say he was, yeah. he was in Pharaoh's court. They were not prophets. Right. They, you're right. They, they had, had sorcery kind of, powers. Yes, yeah. they were powers. So 
In the time of the Bible, there was these powers were available. According to Maimonides, I mean, today for sure they're not available. In the time of the Maimonides, they were sure already not available. But in biblical times, people had powers, they were able to, like the story with, uh, with King Saul who went to the woman in Ain Dor, yes. and, and she should speak to the, to the soul of, of Samuel, to bring down, bring back the soul of Samuel. It's a story in the Bible. You understand? It was done. These powers were existing. Then people had it. I mean, probably many people had it. Not, you know, when the moment this something is available, it's not necessarily only to only for Bilam. More people had it. So God created those powers as, an, as kind of a yin Exactly, yang, exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> because <laughs> exactly, is, yes. Is this in, in the source for you saying that that's not available now? Why it's not available? No, but what well, the source by Manitis. Ah, okay. Maimonides is like negating the whole thing. So Maimonides said this is in the past. Doesn't yeah, I would say it, no. It's even more. Maimonides says it never happened, but other sources says it happened. It means clear that the Rebbe was ever all talk about it. And he said, when Maimonides later times for sure it not exist in the in the biblical times it was there. It was there in the early years, but not later. What Maimonides refers is more to his times, and later it never took place. To to bring together the two opinions is that there was in the in the biblical times it was these powers. We see it from the Bible, yes, from everywhere. Yes. I cannot deny it. But later, for for sure, it doesn't exist. Later years, it doesn't exist. I think we really will agree about it. Maimonides' whole viewpoint is kind of anti-supernatural. So he downplays mm-hmm. angels, he downplays a lot of other things. He downplays, but he doesn't deny <laughs> doesn't, doesn't it. doesn't deny it completely. But. He, but, he, <laughs> but, but my mind this is more, he was in living in a time of intellectuals and everything was logic and mm-hmm. this. And he tried to relax this all kind of beliefs and uh, to 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 be, people bring, bring people down to earth, you know, to ground them. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Isn't there a... Uh a spot in the Torah where it says do not I can't remember the English but something Oved Akum is, is that part of this? or am I in something else? No, Oved Akum is an expression from the Talmud probably Akum is a, Oved Kochavim or Mazalot right. but this is from the Talmud the, the language in the Bible is a little different but the, I mean they, it's written in the Bible you shouldn't go after the sorcerers sorcerers and all of this yeah mm-hmm. that's written in the Bible absolutely obviously it was there why the Torah is to say don't go after them because it's there. Even the Torah says, even when we'll come a prophet and you'll make prophecies and we'll tell you, let's go worship idols, do not, do not believe him. Means somebody will come and make miracles and they'll have show powers of prophecy, still don't go after him. That means it could be a prophecy belonging to another to a person who is bad, who is choosing to worship idols. Okay, then uh, let's continue. We are in page 3 or 2, I think, number 10. No, number 9. Go ahead. God appeared to Bilam and said, Who are these men with you? Bilam replied to God, Balak, son of Tzipor, king of Moab, had sent them to me, saying, Behold, the people that came out of Egypt has covered the face of the earth. Come now and curse him for me, so that I will be able to wage war against him and banish him. God said to Bilam, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Okay, what is happening here? Hashem comes to him in the middle of the night and asking him a question. What are these people? Hashem didn't know what the people. Then, there is many answers to such questions. I mean, there is the question, Ayeka, why Hashem asked Abraham, hey, Adam, where are you, right? Mm-hmm. There is many times, and it's, in many places it's written that God starts, wants, that's a way to start a conversation, not to scare the person. Here, she says, God wanted to, like, to confuse him, to, 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 so to speak, God doesn't really know everything. He knows almost everything, but not really everything. Eh? Maybe, maybe I can get, a, get, get away with that. Then God tells them, he says, they, he's, he right away blames Balak. He says, oh, Balak sent me. Look how he says, this is the people who came out from Egypt. He doesn't mention the name, the Hebrews, the children of Israel. A people, a unknown people. We don't know their names. They don't have a name. A people who came out from Egypt. And they are covering the land. That's, by the way, one of the anti-Semitic techniques. An unknown name. We don't know who they are. Those. We don't even mention their names. I, he wants to curse them. Hashem told them, don't go with them. Don't curse them because the people are blessed already. And Rashi says, don't, don't curse them. And if you'll ask me, I want to go and bless them. We don't need your blessing either, my friend. 
and Rashi points out, it's like we tell to the to the mosquito, to wasp, neither you your honey uh, nor your uh, sting. I don't need anything. Don't give us blessing. Don't give us curse. We don't need your favors. The Jewish people will get a, get away with, will survive without you. Okay. Quick question. Uh, I mean, we're going to get more into this, but I mean, we're already seeing uh, that Bilam. If he is a prophet, I mean, he's, he's got a lot of blind spots there. Uh, why is it that a prophet has a so many blind spots? A prophet is only knows, I read it from the Rebbe many times, a prophet only knows, it's in time with the Tzad only knows what Hashem decides to tell him. So his Doesn't, prophecy is limited then? Very, sure, it's a limit. It's a li we are all limited. <laughs> Even a prophet is limited in his prophecy. He's limited in everything. He's limited in his life age, how old is he, when, he, when he will die. He only gets to know what Hashem tells him. Everyone said that even Moshiach, until a minute before his Moshiach, will not know that he's Moshiach. Hmm. And the same thing prophecies. There is an expression, who said it? Vashem Eli Mimeni. It was a, Elisha said it? God that covered us up for me? About the baby, I think? Mm -hmm. Yes. That he says, Hashem covered us up, God covered it up for me, right? That means Elisha was such a huge prophet and made miracles. He said, God covered us up. There is a concept that God, absolutely, God only tells the prophet what he wants to tell him. And almost, and uh, Bilam was, Bilam couldn't speak to God whenever he wanted. Only God wanted to speak to him. That was true really about all the prophets beside Moses. Moses had this relationship with God whenever he wanted, he spoke to God. Also because God wanted, but still. But the rest of them didn't have this, this level of prophecy. Yeah, a prophet does know everything. Absolutely not. So if he, how can he be the equivalent of Moses if he has so many holes in his knowledge and prophecy? Could be on the level. Of, could be when he had the prophecy, it was on the level of uh, of Moses. That's a good question, and I'm sure I read about that. And there's a, <laughs> a lot of literature. <laughs> and uh, what well, a lot being said about it. But if it was just as when he speaks, he speaks on Moses' and this, level. <laughs> and exactly <laughs> that he, he could stand. It, it's written. I think. I think this is the explanation. I think. All, all the prophets, and they were speaking to God, they were not able to, to be awake, so to speak. They were, even he was sleeping, but later he had a time that he, didn't, he wasn't sleeping and he was still at a prophecy from God. Where a regular, a regular prophet used to lose his control. They used to call a prophet Meshuggah, because he used to lose control completely. He was going into a trance, into a, a trance, exactly. Where Moses was in normal, in cant, in, intact, and, and he was speaking to God. Maybe that's a different. Number 13. Bilam arose in the morning and said to Balak's dignitaries, Go back to your land, for Hashem refuses to allow me to go with you. Moab's dignitaries got up and came to Balak and said, Now, what oh. happened here? He says, Hashem refused me to allow me to go with you. He made it like. You are not enough, not important enough for me. That's why Hashem doesn't let me go with you. Ooh. That He gave them this this understanding, as Rashi says in the Badem, to go with you. You see the Rashi, mm -hmm. but with higher ranking officials than you, we mm -hmm. than you. Understand? That's what He said. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Moab's dignitaries got up and came to Balak and said, Bilam refuses to go with us. Balak persisted and sent dignitaries in greater number and of higher rank than these. They came to Bilam and said to him, The following is a message from Balak the son of poor. Please do not refuse to come to me, for I will honor you greatly, and whatever you tell me I will do, if you would just please come and curse this people for me. He tells him, Don't worry, I'll take care of you. I'll wine you and dine you. We'll take care of you. We'll give you a lot of honor. Because he knew Bilam had a very... He, was, he, had a lot, he wanted the whole world. He, everything belongs to him. And he was very arrogant. The same, a, a prophet, the symbol of a prophet is humbleness. Mm -hmm. What's Moses? The most humble person. Mm -hmm. But here is another prophet who takes it all the way to the other direction. He takes the power and he attributes it to himself. Oh, if God gives me such power, such power, obviously I'm so important. And therefore the whole world belongs to me. Where the other person takes to says, I'm so humble that God give, give, give me such gift and I, 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 I cannot even, I don't deserve any of it. Then he says, he tells him, don't worry, I'll give you enough honor. But Bilam, it was a little insult to Bilam then. He tells him, don't worry, you think I cannot give you enough covet? I can give you enough covet. What Bilam answered them? Bilam answered and said to Balak's servants, 
Even if Balak would give me silver and gold, enough to fill his house, I cannot transgress the word of Hashem my God by doing anything small or great. Then first of all, Balaam Bala is giving him an aimed how much money he really deserves. Even if you give me your house full of gold and silver, really I deserve the whole house full of gold and silver because I'm saving you a war. How much money you save when you save a war, right? That I really deserve everything. But even this, I cannot do against God anything. So, now, continue. 19. Now you also, please remain here overnight and I will get to know what more Hashem uh, tell me. Mm -hmm. God appeared to Balaam that night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, arise and go with them. Mm -hmm. However, whatever I will say to you, you will do. Okay, God tells him you want to go. Go. From this, the Talmud teaches us, "Bederich shadam rotze lelech molichim oto." If you insist to go the wrong direction, go ahead. God tries to stop you. Don't make the mistake. One thing, another time. You stubborn enough, you want to go, go. But that's not going to work out. God tells him, you want to go, go. But whatever I'll tell you, that's what you're going to do. You're not going to make up your own stories. Here. Go ahead. Bilam arose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite dignitaries. Who also settled his donkey early in the morning? Abraham, Abraham Moses, and Mashiach. <laughs> well, then God and told them, and the Medrash says, God told them, Abraham already did it before you. Don't think you're the first Chochem in town. <laughs> okay. God showed anger because he went. And an angel of Hashem placed himself in the way to thwart him as he was riding on his donkey accompanied by his two attendants. The donkey saw the angel of Hashem standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. The donkey <coughs> turned aside from the way and went into the field. Elam struck the donkey to get it back on the way. But the angel of Hashem stood in a narrow path of the vineyards with a barrier at either side. Okay, now what is happening here? He's riding on the donkey and suddenly he sees, suddenly the, the donkey saw something, right? So the angel of Hashem, and she's moving, she's going further. Go ahead, continue. That's perfect for you. Uh, but the angel of Adonai stood in a narrow path of the vineyards with the barrier to either side. When the donkey saw the angel of Adonai, she was pressed against the wall and pressed Bilaam's foot against the wall, and he struck her even more. Adonai's angel passed further ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of Adonai, it crouched beneath Bilaam. Bilaam became angry and beat the donkey with the stick. Okay, then here is the donkey is moving and moving, and finally it didn't, mo didn't move at all. And he got upset with the donkey, and he ate the donkey, right? That this great prophet who is going to kill a whole nation with his mouth, with his own donkey, he had no control. To be the, the donkey you know, was a better the, prophet than Bill, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Animals can see things that humans can't. Because humans, when they'll see it, they'll go crazy. Because they understand. Animals, because they don't understand, it doesn't affect, the, doesn't affect them. It doesn't drive them crazy. How do we understand the angel of Hashem here? I mean, do we understand this as purely an angel? Because we, we have a number of passages. Well, something they, was spiritual. Yeah. It was not physical because yeah. uh, Bill didn't see it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something happened there that moved, that motivated the donkey to run away. The donkey was running away from something, right? Mm -hmm. Then it was the, and, the, and the, the Torah said that it was the angel of Hashem. What means that? It's a messenger. It's another passage where Joshua sees an, an angel with a drawn yeah. sword, the, angel, yes. the, yes. the, the head of the, uh, uh, the, ho the heavenly host. Mm -hmm. uh, is this, uh, in context, you know, this, the same type of angel, same context? I mean, it's, the angel is a spiritual um, creature, if you want. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, the, it's the same idea. It's angels. There is good angels, there are bad angels, there are angels for different mission, um, missions. But it's angels, yeah. Judaism believes in angels. Yeah. It's not the, what means an angel? A messenger of God, one way or another. <coughs> yeah, 
seen the movies. I understand. <laughs> why, 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 I didn't uh, see the movies. <laughs> why does Rashi point out that the, the weapon of the Gentile nations is the sword? Because God promised, uh, God gave um, Jacob, yeah. Isaac gave Esau the blessing, Al-Har Bechotichi, you live on your sword. And what he told Jacob, a call call Yaakov via Daimu the wo- the voice is the voice of Jacob and the end of the end of Esau. That means the Jew and Rashi says that there that Jacob's job is with his mouth, with his prayers, with his learning Torah. Look, even today the Jews, what is their power? They're good lawyers, they're good everything is the mouth, the brains. The hands, no, when it comes to <laughs> basketball and uh, they used to be the, they used to be yeah, the best basketball players. Believe, yeah. <laughs> the really third, yes, all that the, was all different. The basketball <laughs> players were Jews. I really, so it's really surprising what happened during the Terry's. <laughs> <laughs> the Jews, but you know, I mean, even there, my capital Aviv now wins the games, but it's not, it's not our guys. It's not kids from Tel Aviv who are uh, winning the games. And then happens the amazing thing, page 309, number 28. Hashem opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Bilaam, What have I done to you that you have hit me three times? Bilaam said to the donkey, Because you have ridiculed me. Would that I have had a sword in my hand, I would kill you now. No matter what, Bilaam was so angry with the donkey, he says, I I would kill you with a sword. Literally, they had a conversation. And, and uh, that, that, that again, the, the, the jockey is, is a guy who goes to kill a whole nation and he needs a sword to kill his own, his own donkey. The donkey replied to Bill, go ahead. The donkey replied to Billam, am I not the very donkey that you have been riding on all your life until this very day? Was it ever my habit to do this to you? And he said, no. Hashem then enabled Billam to see and he observed the angel of... Uh, Hashem standing in the way with a sword drawn in his hand. He bowed his head and prostrated himself on his hand and face. You need to understand that all of this story is written by prophecy by Moses. That was not, nobody was there, right? And Bilon didn't come later and told the story to somebody. That was Moses written from God. That's the whole story. It was not an event that everybody saw and was witnessed. And it's exactly how God dictated this to, to Moses. Why, why is he prostrating himself on his face? Because uh, he saw an angel of God. Okay. Yeah, we see that a couple of other times. Yeah, sure. People do that because they're representing God, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think by Joshua too. Joshua, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He says he saw the, he suddenly discovered, he saw the angel. So the angel he realized, ah, <laughs> it makes sense now. The whole thing suddenly makes sense. For those who say that the angel is a you know, the Shekinah or the manifestation of God, how, what's your take on that? It's all different. It's all the same. The same, and you know, I mean, it's different expression of the same idea. What is Shekinah? God's presence, kind of like God's a spotlight, presence. you might say. And an angel is an angel. It's all metaphors. It's mm-hmm. spiritual things. It's all metaphors. That one way or another, it's all a way for humans to relate to such concept. The angel of Hashem, go ahead, please. The angel of Hashem said to him, Why did you hit your donkey? This three times. Behold, I came out to obstruct you, because your way is contrary to me. He says, Why you hit the donkey three times? The language that the Torah is using twice, that the word three times, it's not using the regular word shalosh peamim, three times. They use the word shalosh regalim. Regal, what's a regal? Yeah, but what's a, what another meaning for shalosh? Shalosh or shalosh regalim is the three holiday. Three holidays, Passover, Shavuos, and Sukkot, when the Jewish people used to do pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That he says, you trying to destroy a nation who is planning that God wants them to go to Jerusalem three times, you think you can, you have the power against them? That's what he really told them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is yeah. the, the, where it says, mm-hmm. Yeah. What's a Satan? A Satan is somebody who doesn't let you go in front of him. An adversary. Yeah. An adversary, I'm sorry. Exactly, yes. Yeah, Satan is a generic term for an adversary. Mm-hmm. Or All types of adversaries are yeah, Satan. Prosecutors. And that, yeah, that text you can call another person. You know, he's a Satan. He's a, like a, the one who doesn't allow you to do what the right thing to do is a Satan. In that, in that case, 
at that moment. When, when Jacob is wrestling the angel, would that angel have been considered a, a Satan in that mm -hmm. context? It's written that he was the angel of Esau. Mm -hmm. Was it the yeah, Satan? Talmud says that. But the angel yeah. of, in front of the donkey? No, no, no. The angel by it's talking about Jacob. Talking about the Jacob and the angel. Right. If this is the Satan, it's never. It, I never I, saw I've, that. I've never seen I never that, saw it. that context, but it, 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 but as in an essence, adversary, in essence, yes. In <laughs> essence, yes. Anything that, the, uh, anything that doesn't allow holiness to move on to proceed is Satan. Mm -hmm. and of course, this is one of the very few references that we see in the Hebrew Bible to the term Satan. You're right. <sighs> Probably in the five books of Moses, probably the only time, yeah, no? I can't remember another and it, one. And it just translates, I came to obstruct you. Because, yeah. it's, because it doesn't mean the real Satan. Right, right, that's yeah. it. Yeah, it's generic. And yes. we, only, we only see Satan, i.e. The, in the devil capacity yeah. in the book of mm -hmm. Job, basically. You're that's right. <laughs> that's why I, I don't think in the five books of Moses the word Satan is written another time. Do you remember anywhere? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I know it's in Chronicles... Uh, not talking about yeah, but in the five books of Moses. I Maybe I cannot remember everything, but I don't know. Okay, number three, twelve, number thirty-three. And when the donkey saw me, it turned aside these three times. Had she not turned aside before me as she did now, I would surely have killed you and <coughs> she. Thank you. Would have killed you and she. I would let live. Mm-hmm. Continue. Bilam said to the angel of Adonai, I have sinned because I did not know that you were standing in the way before me, and now, therefore, if it is wicked in your eyes, I shall return. The angel of Adonai said to Bilam, Go with the men, but only the word that I will speak to you shall you speak. Bilam then continued to go with Balak's dignitary. Really, really, if, you, if he saw the, the, if so, the angel does not allow him to go, a smart man doesn't ask, should I go back? He goes back. Yeah. But he wanted to go. He said, should I go back? Pretty strong message there. Yeah, yeah I mean, how many, times hard to miss. how many times <laughs> you have to tell you you're in the wrong, in the wrong journey, the wrong business? I told him again, you'll say what he's supposed to say. Is it a female donkey? Okay, number 10. Go ahead, continue. 36. 36. 314, 36, yeah. When Balak heard that Bilam was coming, he went out to meet him to the city of Moab, which is on the boundary of Arnon, at the very edge of the boundary. Balak said to Bilam, Did I not send so many dignitaries to invite you? Why did you not come to me? Am I really capable, incapable of honoring you? Bilam replied, replied to Balak, Now that I have come to you, have I any power to say anything? Only the word that Hashem puts in my mouth will I speak. Here he says to him again, it was like Bolog was a little late at the time. Why you, you think I cannot carry I know you enough? But he told him, nothing will help you. I can only speak what Hashem says. Finally he arrived, the meeting between Bilam and Bolog, the two great people are together now. Now starts the, the, the plan starts to, they want to bring out the plan. Bilam went with Balak and they came to Kiryas Hutsos. Balak slaughtered cattle and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the dignitaries that were with him. In the morning, Balak took Balaam, and he led him up to Bamos Baal. From there he saw part of the people. Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare me seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Balaam requested. Balak and Balaam then sacrificed as burnt offerings an ox and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go away. Perhaps Hashem will appear to me, and whatever he will show me, I will tell you. And he went away alone. Okay, then Bilam they offered the sacrifice, that's the whole thing. Why they offered seven sacrifices, seven uh, altars. And he tells Bilam, that's the bottom line, he tells, Bilam tells Balak, I have to go away. I'll see what Hashem tells me, and I'll come back. Go ahead, he's coming back. God changed to appear to Bilam, and he said to him, I have set up the seven altars, and I offered as burnt offering an ox and a ram on the altar. Hashem put a message in Bilaam's mouth, and he said, Return to Balak and tell him as follows. When he returned, Balak was still standing next to his burnt offerings, together with all the dignitaries of Moab. Everybody was waiting to hear what Bilaam has to say. Continue. Okay, Bilaam set forth his parable and said, From Aram has Balak, 
king of Moab, brought me out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come curse Yaakov for me, go invoke wrath against Israel. In, used, here suddenly, Bilam knows the name of the Jews. He not only knows the name of the Jews, he knows both names. He calls them Jacob, come curse me J Yaakov, and come uh, invoke the wrath against Israel. Yeah. What means invoke the wrath? He was, as Rashi says, he said, do it on both names, just in case. What Bilam was trying to do is, as Rashi will say it in a few places, he was trying to find the moment. There is a moment a day that I would say that God gets upset with the Jews. One second. He was waiting for this moment. <coughs> and to eat on this moment. To utilize this moment. And these days God didn't, wasn't angry with the Jews at all. Not even for a moment. Basically he was looking for the cracks to stick in a curse. So the rooster crows or something. What? I think it corresponds to the time when the rooster would yeah, crow. Yeah, that's what Talmud says. But, and, and, that, and that's what he's trying to <coughs> Continue. How can I curse when God has not cursed? Mm -hmm. What divine wrath can I invoke if Hashem has not been angry? Even when they were supposed to be cursed, so to speak, God didn't curse them. Even if God doesn't want to curse them, who, who, who am I? I cannot do anything. Go ahead. For I, I, for I view it from the mountain peaks, I gaze upon it from the hills. Behold, a people which shall dwell alone and will not be reckoned among the nations. He says here some beautiful words about the Jewish people. Merosh tzuri merenu. I see them from the mountain peaks and, the, and upon the, from the hills is, com is compared to the, to the fathers, the matri patriarchs and the matriarchs. They are the mountains and the hills of the Jewish people. They are the foundation of the Jewish people. And then he says, there are am levadad ishkon. There are a nation who will stay alone. When Yitzchak Rabin, and the Rebbe was 70 years old, 70, celebrated 70th birthday, Yitzchak Rabin came to convey a message to the Rebbe, a blessing in the name of the Israeli government. He was at that time the ambassador of Israel in, the, in, the, in, uh, in Washington. He started a conversation, then the Rebbe told them, I would tell them that you feel lonely in Washington. And then the Rebbe started a whole conversation about Am Levadad Ishkon, that the Jewish people are a nation of their own. The Rebbe asked them, what do you think? Is this imposed by, on us by, by the Gentiles? Or it's also something because we are unique, because we are special? And the Rebbe said it's a combination of these two things together. And nothing will help us as much as we try to be among of the whole nation, as much as it to mix among all of them and never help us. We have to always remember we are Am Levadadishkon. We are a nation dwells who dwells alone. We are what makes us into a nation is not what makes everybody else into a nation. What makes people what makes a regular nation to be a nation? What makes you an American? You live in America, you enjoy the American culture. And you speak English. And there's American values. That's a part of the culture. Yeah. And culture, so values. Fair enough. Not so with the Jewish people. Now, the same thing is a Chinese. Well, who is a Chinese? He was born in China. He has a land, a China land. He has, he, has, he has a culture and he has a language. Take away from him this tree. He's not a Chinese. The Jewish people do not have their language. Nobody speaks Hebrew. We have, a, we have a language where nobody is, doesn't, doesn't identify you as a Jew but you're speaking Hebrew. Culture, even if I don't eat falafel, I'm still Jewish. <laughs> right? And, 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 uh, and a land, for 2,000 years we did not have a land. What makes us a nation is the Torah. Then we are a very unusual nation. We will always not be a nation like any other nations. For so many years, in the last hundred years, the Zionist movement is trying to make the Jewish people a nation like any other nation. And for some reason, it doesn't work out. They just try again and again and again. And always it's like, they are, we are almost there and flop. The whole UN is against Israel. 
what we wanted. Finally, we are a part of the nations. The UN ex agreed that Israel should have, the Jewish people should have a land. Fine, Bo Hashem, we have a country, a state of Israel, and everybody in Israel celebrates the day that the UN made it official. No, it helped us a lot. That's the only good thing that the UN did since then. Since they didn't do anything good in the, in the world. What I mean to say is, Am Levadad Ishkon is a fact. It's not something that you can argue. It's, it's, it's a fact that exists for 3,000 years. It was true by Bilam, and until today it didn't change. The Jewish people have a double standard. Well, every, everybody else is allowed, and the Jews is not allowed. Everybody conquers the land, doesn't have to give it back. The Israelis have to give it back. And so on and on and on and on. Always demanded from me. And that's what, you know, sometimes somebody who looks from far can identify things clearer. When you are inside, you see all the, you know, when you see too close, you see all the, fa all the failures of people. He, we had, this, this Bilam thing was the biggest blessing that happened to the Jewish people. He identified the Jews better than anybody. And Nam Levadad Ishkon is one of the most amazing statements he said about the Jewish people. When it says they shall dwell alone, though, I mean, obviously we, we, we have dwelled among many Gentile nations. And then it's not, it's not a, uh, look, it doesn't say dwell alone, uh, dwell alone and will not be recount, recounted among the nations. That's what he says. Dwell alone means within the nation. You okay. can live in America and still be lonely. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Lonely not in a negative sense, lonely in a positive sense. You're different. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, um, Abraham said, um, when he told um, Ephron, he told the people of Het, he told them, Ger toshav anochi mohem. Ger means a foreigner, toshav means a citizen. He says, I'm a foreigner and a citizen among you. One of the commentaries said, what does this mean? I'm a citizen, I pay taxes like you, I'm an East in the army like you, but I'm a foreigner. In culture, I'm a foreigner. Needs to say, it's what we are equal citizens and we're carrying all the burdens of every citizen, but then we have something unique that makes us, will make us lo makes, makes us a, 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 a nation that dwells alone. So it, it says we're different. We are different, okay. exactly. And never, and we'll, ne and we'll never, will never happen that will, and even when the Jew thinks that he's almost like everybody, people around them remind them who he is. Mm -hmm. There are verses in Deuteronomy that says God picked us not because we were the biggest nation or the best people or anything like that. It's just, uh, he picked us to be different. Uh, You're right, exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's what, and that's what, and, and, and Bilam nailed it. You, you mentioned that in another class with Moshe, why he picked him to go to Pharaoh because he was from almost an outside looking in and I'm not from these people. I didn't grow up with these Right, he grew up, he grew up, within, he grew up in, by Pharaoh's house, therefore it was easier for him. An outsider can, can redeem the Jewish people. Here is on a different level, but an outsider sees things mm -hmm. that, that an insider doesn't see. Number 10, what's Pastor Ed? Yeah. Who can count on the dust of Yaakov or count the seed of Yisrael? <coughs> May my soul die to the death of the righteous, and let uh, my end be like his. Balak said to Bilaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but you have in fact blessed them. Bilaam replied and said, Only what Adonai tells me must I be careful to say. Balak then said to him, Come with me to another the invisible, place. The plan didn't work out. He gave him blessings. Yeah. But Balak doesn't give up. Plan B. Plan B, exactly. <laughs> From where you will see them, but you will see only a part of them without seeing them all, and curse them for me from there. He took him, Bilaam, to the field of Zophim, uh, to the peak of the mountains. He built seven altars and sacrifices a burnt offering, a bull and a ram on each altar. He then said to Balak, Stand here next to your burnt offering, and I will be called here by chance. I deny a chance to appear to Bilaam and place the word in his mouth. He said, Return to Balak and say as follows. Okay, what he said. I mean, Mark, you want to continue? When he returned, he, Balak, <coughs> was still standing next to his burnt offerings accompanied by the Movite uh, dignitaries. Balak asked, what did Hashem say? It, like, Balak tried to, like, to insult him. No, what Hashem said? I mean, you say, you're such a <laughs> huh? What Hashem said? Bilaam set forth his parable and said, Arise, Balak, and here, listen closely to me, son of Zippor. He rise, he might not stand up, I'm speaking now in the name of God. He gave him right away, he got back on him right away. You stand up, I'm speaking in the name of God, don't make fun here. 
God is not like man, that he should act falsely, nor is he mortal, that he should change his mind. Would he say and not do it, or speak and not fulfill it? Okay. Behold, I was... Before we... Yeah. Uh, kind of one of the famous lines here, God, God is not a man, and some other translations. Mm -hmm. And again, we've got actually four different variations of that in various parts of the Torah. What, obviously, Jews have used that against Christians to say that you know God can't come down as a human being. Oh, what, what's your in, interpretation? Of no, that? I mean, <laughs> what what he tells them, God is is not something that changes. It doesn't change his mind. It doesn't. It the world doesn't affect him. He's not affected by people, by oh. the nature. Moshe by, changed his mind. Moshe, not the, really. It means change his mind. You can, yeah, yeah. I know why. I, 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 I know we're going with this. <laughs> you can change from bad to good, but not from good to bad. From bad to good means God always leaves the door open to be changed for good. It's written that a prophet who says a prophecy, something bad hap to happen, and it didn't happen. It does mean that he's a false prophet, because God can change from bad to good. But if the prophet said something good will happen, didn't happen. That's a sign that he's a false prophet. Because if God already told the prophet to say it, that will stay like this. Then he didn't really change his mind. But that's what really... Okay, God changes in responses to human behavior quite frequently. God is not really affected by human behavior. There is a certain level of the Shekhinah who decide. Basically, God decides to be affected by certain things, but God really is not affected by anything. But that's a whole discussion on its own. <laughs> I don't want to continue. We don't want to sure. get lost there. Sure. Go ahead. You want to continue? Um, Behold, I was commanded to bless, and when he had blessed, I could not reverse it. One does not see evildoers in Yaakov, and he has seen no transgression in Yisrael. Hashem, his king, uh, his king is with him, and he has the kingship's friendship, the okay. king's friendship. What he says here is, Lo ibi toven Yaakov. God does not see any bad things in the, by the Jewish people. He just doesn't see it. When you love somebody, you don't see f f wrong in them. Mm -hmm. In your own children, you never see anything. Like that. They're the best. Depends on which time of day and which That's child. <laughs> <laughs> but even what you see and what other people see is a whole different level. God loves them and he never doesn't see, doesn't see anything, anything wrong with them. Even when they are making him angry, he loves them. Um, you want to read? God, who has brought them out of Egypt, has shown his great faith to them. For there is no sorcery in Yaakov. Then first of all, he says, God, who took him out of Egypt. You said, our people came out of Egypt on their own. They didn't go out on their own. God took him out from Egypt. Continue, continue. Not a cold power against Israel. In due time, it will be said to Yaakov in Israel, what has God done? Before okay, let's stop right here. He says there is no sorcery in Jacob. We don't need sorcerers. We don't need any of this kind. The Jewish people are above that. They are strong. They have God themselves protecting them. They learn Torah and they are above angels even. And they don't need anybody to help them, basically. They are not, if, more than that, they are not affected by all of this. What do we do with, like, astrologers and people like that who make these claims? Exactly. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I mean. The Should Jewish, people, the the Jewish yeah. people are not affected by astrologers. Mm -hmm. It means to say, even the astrologers will come and say that this star shows this way, yeah. this star shows this way, a Jewish person can change his yeah. destiny by doing mitzvahs, by doing tshuva. We see that with uh, Pharaoh. We said that, we said that, you're right, we said it many times, that's in the Talmud, that's a whole thing that we, we spoke about it a few times, that a Jewish person is not, is, not is stronger than the stars, is above the stars, so to speak. Isn't that what we're saying when we say Mazel Tov, to some extent? Well, you're talking about the Mazel coming down. The constellations. Yes. Good we constellations. Are good, that's what we're trying to wish on us of good constellation, but really we are above that. Yeah. We are above Mazel. It, there is a, st a statement in the Talmud, the Ein Mazal Israel. The Jewish people do not, are not dependent on Mazel, on, on constellations. We are above that, absolutely. That's what he's saying, really. Mm -hmm. Then he continues on page 327, number 24. Behold, a people that rises like a young lion <clears throat> and lifts itself up like a lion, he does not lie down until it devours its prey and drinks the blood of its kill. 
literally, I mean, it, it could mean a, a people who is fighting, but as Rashi wants to say, they rise like lion to pray in the morning. That takes a lot of lioness to, to raise up in the morning to daven every day. And, and, uh, and doesn't go to sleep before he says the Shema. That's how the Rashi explains it. Go ahead. Balak said to Bilam, also do not curse them, also do not bless them. Oh, he says the second time, he said, don't do me any favors, don't curse them, don't bless them. Bilam answered Balak and said, did I not tell you that all that Adonai tells me uh, will I do? Yeah, uh, didn't I? Didn't I tell you? I, didn't I, I, I told you up I, I, before. Before, and you know the deal. Don't complain now. But Balak is not giving up. Balak then said to Bilam, "Come, I will take you somewhere else. Perhaps God will consider it proper, and you will curse them for me from there." Okay. Balak took Bilam to the peak of Peor, which overlooks the Yeshimon. Why he took him to Peor? Wasn't that a, uh, that was a bad place. Later they did, oh, they worshipped idols in Peor. And Bilam, <laughs> Balak was also a, like a saucer, and he knew this is a good, bad place for the Jews. He said, let's take him there. You know, but there is a bad place, a bad day, a bad environment. Maybe now it's going to work. That was a place for idol worshipping. Had they, had they already passed, they already passed through Baal Pillar. Not yet. Not yet. No, they, it's written in Egypt, yeah. But this, is, this, this place is a place that they were going to worship idols. Exactly. Go ahead, continue. Bil'am said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare for me seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Bil'am said, and he sacrificed as a burnt offering a bull and a ram on each altar. <coughs> when Bil'am saw that it was favorable to Hashem to bless Israel, he did not approach it as as at each time toward sorcery, but he set his face toward the wilderness. Oh, he said he didn't even try. He said twice, God wants them to bless the Jewish people. You know, the Talmud says that the best blessing the Jewish people got is from Bilam. Isn't that Matu? Yeah, in a minute we'll get there. But okay. what I mean to say is, the Talmud says, Yochicham Moshe Shoavam, who should give, re who should rebuke you? Somebody who loves you. Because somebody who hates you or says bad things about you, you don't, you don't even know. You know, who should give who should give compliments? If a parent compliments his child, everybody says, yeah, sure, yeah. what are you going to say? If somebody who doesn't like you compliments you, you know that's a real compliment. Who should give rebuke you? Somebody who loves you, because somebody who hates you rebuke you, said he only finds everything, whatever I do is bad. That's what Hashem did. Moses reprimanded the Jewish people before he died. And be, who Moses who loved them reprimanded them. And, and uh, Bilam who hates them, blessed them. That you know that's real. If Bilam can say a nice thing, you know it's for sure. Go ahead, continue. Um, Bilam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to its tribes, and the Spirit of God rested upon him. What he saw, he saw how the, 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 uh, the doors of the, the entrance of the tents the are, not, are not against each other. It means to say nobody sticks his nose in other people's businesses. Everybody lives a sure he's talking about Jews here? A private life. At least there was a time there. At least the doors were not. <laughs> Let me go ahead, continue. He set forth his parable and said, This is the declaration of Balaam, the son of Beor. This is the declaration of the man of the open socketed eye. Whoa. Oh, what is he saying here? He lost his eye. Rashi says, What really he wanted to do, in num look on page 3, Terry, number 2. Balaam raised his eyes. Mm -hmm. He strove to induce the evil eye in them. My whole plan was to, to dedicate the whole, spe the whole class about that evil yeah. eye. <laughs> but it's a little late, but we'll speak, we'll speak in short. What he said was, but because there is something too important to, to <coughs> say, that let's do it, maybe we do another time we'll do about the evil eye. Let's, there is 332, continue to read. This is the declaration of one who hears God's utterance, who sees the vision of the Almighty fallen with open eyes. How goodly are your tents, Yaakov, your dwelling places, Israel. He saw, that's what he saw. He saw that the Matovo Alecha Yaakov Mishkenotecha Israel. Once was a chazan came to the Rebbe. The Rebbe told them, he says he's going to be a cantor for the holidays. The Rebbe told them, you know how the prayer starts? The, what's the beginning of the prayer? Matovo, right? The Rebbe said, 
the prayer starts with a, with a compliment about the Jewish people. Yeah? And mm -hmm. I want to accomplish something for you. I want to get from you something. The best way I can say, I saw your children, your grandchildren. Ah! <laughs> I opened you out. We come to Hashem, we ask for something, we start, we begin with a compliment to the, of, of the Jewish people. To say it can say only somebody who loves the Jewish people to such a level, can reach to such a level of saying such a statement. And I heard that, I saw a video, I, didn't, I wasn't there. I was blown away when I heard it. You start the service with a compliment of the Jewish people. Don't say, First of all, you say something nice, then we'll talk to you. Then God is ready to listen to you. There is a custom to give charity before you pray. Because God, you came to God, God I want, he said, what do, you, what do you do for others, number one. Number two, it's written before we say Matova, we say, I take upon myself to love every Jew. To fulfill the mitzvah of loving your fellow Jew. It's not in the text, that's before. It's in, in, un, in the printed statement without the vows. But then we started Matovo. God says, who are you? Oh, Mr. God, your children. Ah, you cannot find like them. They are gold. That's a very, very important lesson. Now, if you're not in a rush, you'll talk a few minutes about the evil eye. What's an evil eye? An evil eye is something, you know, it's written about, anybody who's afraid of an evil eye, the Talmud says, he should say, I am from the, de from the descendants of Joseph. And Joseph, it's written, they, they, the descendants will be like fish. Why like fish? The fish cannot get the evil eye. Why? Because nobody can see them. They're under the water. What's an evil eye? An evil eye means like this. God gives us blessings. Everything is good and fine. Then comes somebody and starts to be jealous. And he turns to God and he says to God, God, why him? Is he better than me? Why not me? Is that better? And when too much of this accumulates, it's awakening. It's like, oh, but in God's eye, you have to open your file. Nobody wants to have the evil eye of the IRS on them, right? No matter how good you are. The same thing is with, with, with God. You don't want to be judged again if you really deserve it. But as long as you get it, as long as it's under the radar, fine, it's going. When you're weakening judgment, when your good causes other people to be jealous, that's a problem. Then God said, that's, that's not what I intended. I wanted you to make other people feel good. If your blessings cannot bring blessings to others and brings jealousy to others, makes other people not comfortable, that affects you. And that's the problem with the evil eye. So uh, the English expression, the green-eyed monster, is kind of jealousy. Is, is that I never related to Green sense? eye man Why green? Expression? Why not yellow? Green is envy. <laughs> green is envy? Yeah. Really? That's the saying. Yeah, it's the saying. Green, green is envy. Green, you're, you, can be gr you can be green with envy. Oh, there is. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you get upset and you get like green, um, and then the, basically that's the idea. That why you so why should be your fault that somebody is jealous? Because you have to make sure that people shouldn't be jealous at you. It means to say how you do it by wearing your blessings in an humble way. You can have everything, but you don't have to show off. You can drive a Maserati, from my point of view, but if nobody knows. I would not know. I don't run around the parking lot to see what everybody drives. And I, even if I see, I don't even know what it is. But if you come and tell me I'm driving a Maserati, I say, oh, yeah, sure, oh, no. <laughs> but now most of the people, they wouldn't drive these cars if they cannot run around and tell everybody. If they cannot show off the expensive badge, then why do they need a badge? To know the time? Any time, any clock can tell you that. Then the problem is not what you have. The problem is how you do with it. God says if your blessings makes other people uncomfortable, that's a problem. Yeah. That's what evil lie in one word is all about. And you see it in the, in the, in the Bible, we see in the story of, the, of, the, of the, the, the tablets, the second set of tablets, and Moses came, brought them down, God told them, nobody should see it, nobody should do anything. Moses walked in with the second set of tablets, sneaked it into that camp, put it in the box, nobody ever saw it. Why? Because Rashi says the first time it was too much noise. Koilois and Keilois said there's too much. And I know the evil eye eat it. 
the one of the explanation of the 24,000 students mm -hmm. of Rabbi Akiva, it was the, the Rebbe explained it. What happened there? The Rebbe said, the evil eye them. Together. They were not nice to each other, true. The evil eye is like the crack we spoke before. Like Bilam was looking for the crack. Where can he find something bad? The evil eye falls in when there is, when there is a crack. There is already a bad thing from before. Now came the evil eye. Sealed it. So what is the actual power of the evil eye? Is that the Satan in that sense? Or is that it's us. Okay. Uh, forget about the Satan. Yeah. Evil eye is people who are jealous of others' good. So and if they're jealous and they create a hard time for you, basically. Yes, <laughs> but they. But then why should it be my fault? Because we have to make sure that they're not jealous. How I make sure they're not jealous? By making them feel good about themselves. And more than that, making sure that my good blessings don't, don't make other people feel bad. That's why the best thing is not to brag. Yeah, you used to, um, people used to ask my father how your children are doing, he used to say, Baruch Hashem. That was the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. What do you need to go on around? It's like this. If your kids do well, think of Baruch Hashem. There is other big kids who don't do other people's kids who don't do well. Why do you to make them feel bad? Then you don't run around and complain, oh, life is hard. Don't go to the other extreme. People do very well in business. They say, oh, it's so hard. That's not nice. God gives you blessings. Don't deny the blessings. But you don't have to brag about it. You have to... People ask you, how are you? Bo Hashem, you move on. Mm -hmm. They're developing, they're talking. Who needs it? it may, there's so humility. many people. It's all humility. It's all about understanding that the blessings is coming from God. So the evil eyes all over Facebook, huh? when everybody's bragging about their... Absolutely, family. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and that's, that's the whole problem. And, and whenever... It's not what you have. Nobody cares for what you have. People care when you are bragging about it. And you're making it, making them uncomfortable. And that's why it's a little bit of out the fault of the person who gets the evil eye because he causes the people to be jealous. Sometimes it's beyond your control. I mean, sometimes you try the best and there are certain people who are just so miserable that nothing is good enough for them and everybody, they are, they are jealous of everybody. But most of the times it's up to us not to, not to, to, be in, to do it in a, in a nice way. That's in, 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 a, in a, what the Talmud also says, Mandalay copied Lake Abdina. If somebody is not, shouldn't be obsessed with evil eye, you understand? We should try to do our best, but not to run around with uh, red ribbons and hamsas and all of this nonsense. You just live your life, you have faith in God, you do the right thing, and you move on. Because you cannot, if you get obsessed with the evil eye, the Talmud says basically it affects you more. If you don't care for it, it affects you less. In essence, it's like sorcery in a sense. If it's sorcery, but it's, uh, no, it's not sorcery. But it's, it's up to you how much it's going to affect you.